They're brothers, but so were Cain and Abel. They were into porn, they were into drugs, they were into anything they could get their hands on to make money. They're just nouveau riche dumbasses. Committing deadly sins is the Pirano family's bread and butter. Deep Throat was considered to be the most profitable film of all time. They stopped counting it. They started weighing the money. That's how much money they were making. When this nuclear family goes ballistic, it's cause their greed is way thicker than their blood. I had never heard of a betrayal like that. One person that has absolutely nothing to do with this gets killed. It's devastating. My name is Steve Sharippa. I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. I've seen good people turn bad and bad people turn worse. Some took contracts to carry out a hit. Some were victims of a hit. To hitmen, life and death is just part of the business. It's nothing personal. January 4th, 1982, Brooklyn, New York. Joseph Pirano and his son, Joe Jr., are going to a meeting with their Colombo crime family bosses. What they don't know is they're heading into an ambush. What makes it even worse is the plan to kill them has been hatched by Joe Sr.'s business partner, his big brother, Tony. I had never heard of a betrayal like that, where a brother would actually come in and ask that his brother and his nephew be killed. To me, it was unbelievable. So how did the relationship between two brothers turn into carnage? Every family has its disputes. Bickering over money can lead to hard feelings, for sure. So what if you and your brother own the most profitable porn flick ever made? Deep Throat. We're talking about tens, maybe hundreds of millions. And what if you're lying, cheating, nincompoop of a brother? What if that fat, no good pile of crap stole tens of millions of that movie's profits from you and your family? Would you want him dead? Yeah, I thought so. I think the family kind of fractured, as families do when they start making tons and tons and tons of money. It all started in happier days. It's the early 70s. Joe Pirano is a gangster from a gangster family. And life is good. Joe isn't especially smart or ambitious, but his big brother, Tony, Let's him tag along. Each of them was a member of the Colombo crime family, and they were involved in the typical gangster uh, activities, loan sharking, gambling, extortion. They were thugs and hoodlums, you know, street people. They didn't have any finesse. <laughs> they were into anything they could get their hands on to make money. Salvatore Big Sal Michiata is on the same mafia crew as Joe and Tony Pirano. He doesn't much like either one. They were bullies, very loud, very boisterous type people. In the Colombo family, nobody liked them at all. They aren't exactly peas from a pod. Melons would be more like it. Elder brother Tony is the brains. He was in a 400 pound area, so that they nicknamed him Fat Tony Pirano. Big as Fat Tony might be, if he's the brains, then Joe's the stomach. They call him the whale. But not all of his blubber is on his waistline. Plenty of it is between his ears. No one had a nice thing to say about Joe the whale, other than he was fat and he couldn't fit in the doorway. The brothers have a nice little racket making dirty movies that play the perverts in peep shows. The home video revolution is years away, and Hollywood movies are prudish. So porn fans have to take whatever garbage they can get. And make no mistake, what the Piranos make is crap. 
Those were basically loops, which are short films. They'd be really grainy, and they, they weren't shot really well. You really couldn't see a lot of what was going on in, in the films. Um, they weren't that good. Still, low budgets and a black market product make the brothers a steady profit. And they control the whole shebang, especially in their hometown. Times Square was really a cesspool. It was all pornographic theaters, peep shows, prostitutes. Today, you couldn't buy a loose cigarette in Times Square. Then you could buy almost anything your heart desired. The theaters paid at least 50% of their income to the mob, or to the mob through the Perenos. You would think to the mob, money is money. But even gangsters have standards, and to them, the Piranos are just as skanky as their wares. Pornography was thought to be the lowest rung of organized crime. When I was inducted into the family, the Colombo family, I was explicitly told that there was nothing to be done in the pornography business. We were not to be involved in it was one of the rules and regulations that needed to be followed. Remember, these guys are very heavily Catholic, and they have wives, and the wives are always saying, why are you making those dirty movies, you know? Those things would be disgusting. They would be dishonorable to be involved in anything like that. The mafia that I joined would have had no nothing to do with that kind of industry. The fact that their crew looks down on porn makes it Easy for Tony and Joe to keep it all in the family. They both have sons, and in both cases, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Tony's son, Butchie, is like his father. He's smart and has a good head for business. Butchie had a reputation as being a charming, roguish kind of a character. He was one of these guys that really knew how to hang out in New York and, you know, have fun. You know, he was a fun guy, and everyone liked him. Butchie dreams of turning his family's porn racket into a Hollywood hit factory, with him at the helm. He wanted to be an auteur, you know? He really wanted to be this filmmaker, would make big Hollywood features, you know, not just, you know, pornography. Joe the Whale's son, Joe Jr., is nothing like his cousin, Butchie. Jr.'s a bonehead who coasts on his connections just like his old man. It would be difficult for you to have a real conversation with them. They didn't know anything about the movie industry or anything like that. The fortunes of the Pereno brothers changed one day when into their office strolls a guy with an idea that will revolutionize the smut industry. Gerard Damiano is a New York hairdresser who wants to be a movie director. And his earth-shaking idea is to make a dirty feature film, you know, a story people talking, pretending to be other people, the whole bit. Back in those days, you know, that was really unheard of. You know, X-rated films were shot in a hotel room with a couple of hookers. You know, that was the film. Damiano even has a star in mind. He's written a porno comedy for a woman who has a very special talent. Her name is Linda Lovelace. It's no accident he calls his movie Deep Throat. He was inspired by Linda Lovelace. There's no question. I think really what struck my father about uh, Linda was her innocence, that it was almost a contradiction. Here was someone with this, you know, amazing sexual technique, but that had the appeal of the girl next door. At first, the girl next door appeal is lost on the Piranos. He had a big, big fight with the Piranos because they didn't think Linda was attractive. And, and Gerard Damiano would scream back, but Deep Throat's going to become a household word. You know, they didn't quite get it. They didn't understand what he was trying to do. Um, for example, they didn't like the title. They wanted to call it The Sword Swallower. And he had to convince them, no, no, trust me, you know, Deep Throat. They're also nervous that Deep Throat's budget is about $22,000. That's 15 times the cost of a porn loop. 
So $22,000 to make this movie with this not very attractive girl, well, they really didn't know what they were doing. The Perinos are not impressed with Linda. And Damiano insists they at least bring her in for an audition. But when they experience her special talent firsthand, let's just say they have a change of heart. Linda Lovelace's special talent, and this is hard to say on a PG-rated show, but she uh, could perform fellatio. I don't mean to be crude, but that was her selling point. Deep throat was kind of a sex technique people hadn't heard of or seen. There was no word deep throat until the movie. And people wanted to see that. After Linda's trip to the casting couch, the Piranos agreed to bankroll Damiano's deep throat. My father was responsible for all creative aspects of the film. The Piranos were responsible for distribution and, of course, the funding and they were gonna split the profits three ways. He went home and wrote the script over the weekend, and by Monday, he went back and showed this to the Perinos and said, this is the film I wanna make. Miami, winter 1972. Damiano takes just six days to shoot his movie. My father, he did everything in that movie except get laid. He came up with the idea, wrote the script. He did the editing. He was involved in every aspect of that, of that film from beginning to end. At the time, I was seven years old. We were on the set, and the atmosphere was um, very exciting. You know, my father never allowed us to be anywhere near um, what they called the nitty gritty. When they were filming the sex scenes, we were ushered, you know, off the set. But, um, you know, we were very aware that our father was a filmmaker and, and we were proud of that, you know, and, and we were, were raised to believe that there wasn't anything wrong with, uh, with sexuality. The big question is, will it make money? Oh boy, will it? Deep Throat goes on to become the most profitable porn film ever made. Tony and Joe Pereno and their sons, Butchie and Joe Jr., are poised to become mega millionaires. Their family fortune is built on a foundation of lies, exploitation, and threats of violence. What could possibly go wrong? January 1982. The new year is just four days old and mobsters slash porn distributors, Joseph the World Pirano and his son are on their way to a meeting. What the two Joes don't know is the sit down is a setup. Who they'll be meeting is their maker. 10 years earlier, it seemed like the fun would never end for the Pirano brothers. Their film Deep Throat opens in 72 and it hits at just a moment Mr. and Mrs. America are thinking they need to explore their wild side. It was just the perfect movie at the perfect time. People had been talking about having sex in the 60s, but nobody really had it until the 70s. People were ready for a porn revolution. In Tucson, future porn legend Annie Sprinkle is working the popcorn counter at the local movie house. Deep Throat was the first porn movie I had ever seen, and the first porn movie a lot of people had seen. And I remember just being totally awed, shocked, amazed, seeing, you know, genitals big on the screen. It was a religious experience. <laughs> the reason why Deep Throat made it was because it was a comedy. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, 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 well, there it is, you little bugger, there it is. It was a lot of fun. So people came from all walks of life. Linda Lovelace was on the cover of Esquire. Johnny Carson started making jokes. Once Johnny Carson inc includes it, 
in his monologue, you know, you're set. Deep Throat was happening. It was the film to see, and everyone was going to see it. And I remember working in that ticket booth and just the cash coming through. It was unbelievable. I couldn't sell tickets fast enough. The success of Deep Throat means the Pirano brothers go from bottom-feeding pariahs to filthy rich, big-time earners for the Colombo crime family. The Piranos revolutionized the porn business and brought the mob into it in a big way. The mob is like a chameleon. They're always changing. They always want to supply whatever it is to the people, whatever they want. And as society changed, they changed right along with it. Publicly, uh, the mafia has always been against pornography, but they're in the life to make money. When porn became big, the mob was standing right there, ready to give them whatever they wanted. It was just making so much money. And the rest of the mafia realizes that it's like it's a product like drugs were to the mafia in the 50s, that they could make hundreds of millions of dollars. It's like heroin. So basically, everyone started making porn films. You know, anybody that believed in the old folklore and all the old stuff about honor and integrity that was all gone by the wayside it's like a whirlwind like the tornado was taking over the mob was absolutely out of the honor business and it was strictly a money-making enterprise now butchie produced the film but it's tony and joe's distribution network that makes deep throat such a winner their approach is classic mafia simple and blunt they didn't just send the film out and go buy box office receipts. They had their own people there to make sure they got every dollar. A guy would fly the prints in, give it to the theater owners, and say, we want 50% of this at the end of the week. They want to make sure their numbers were accurate. So I think people got a few bucks an hour to sit there at the door counting how many people went in. So they had a very tight control on the distribution. This method is so effective, the Pirano's office is soon swamped with cash. They stopped counting it. They started weighing the money. That's how much money they were making. There was money from the floor to the ceiling, and they didn't want to leave because they were afraid the place would get broken into. If there is a break-in, it'll probably be their friends with crowbars. I mean, there's no loyalty in this crowd, not when it comes to piles of cash. Director Jerry Damiano finds that out pretty quickly. The Piranos decide to cut him out of his share of the film's profits. My father began to understand who he was dealing with. So when they made him the quote unquote offer he couldn't refuse, he felt that he was lucky to get out of there with his life. They pay him $25,000 to go away for good. They say money changes people, but that's not true. What it does is give people the means to show you who they've been all along. So who are the Perenos, really? Fat Tony is a businessman. He invests in real estate and garment companies. He runs them all just like an old school mobster. Cause that's exactly who he is. Fat Tony and Butchie, they weren't one trick ponies. They used the money that they got from Deep Throat to branch out. Butchie Pereno wanted to be a filmmaker more than he wanted to be a mafioso guy, so he went to Hollywood. And he set up this film distribution company called Bryanston Films. Butchie's good at it, too. They had about 20 hits in the first year of their business. Butchie's company distributes the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Bruce Lee's Return of the Dragon, and Andy Warhol's Frankenstein. Basically, they had their fingers on the pulse of pop culture and really took some chances and made quite a bit of money on their own. It was really his niche. He would have gone on to make movies forever. You know, he was just the type of guy that, that was his thing. He loved it. And as for Joe the Whale and his son, Joe Jr., they have no dreams, just appetites. Who are they really? Jerks. 
greedy, low-class jerks. It's who they've always been. And getting rich just makes that crystal clear. I think they were kind of like a white trash family who suddenly hits the lottery. You know, you buy everything. They paraded their wealth, which was not considered a good quality. Here, this is for you. And this is for them. Oh. They're just nouveau riche dumbasses. And so they weren't well thought of. So just when the Pirano brothers and their sons are showing their true colors, comes the time when they need to have each other's backs. Deep Throat might be a national sensation, but lots of people think graphic on-screen sex is obscene. Uh, we're here to execute a search warrant on the uh, premises for uh, an obscene movie. And playing it on Main Street USA causes a few run-ins with the law. The Perinos and the entire porn industry began to feel the wrath of prosecutors, you know, in the Bible Belt, who uh, went after them using obscenity laws. In 1976, things heat up when a Tennessee prosecutor gets the bright idea of charging everybody who made Deep Throat with conspiracy to violate obscenity laws, Tony and Joe Perino included. It's a big First Amendment case, and the trial becomes a media circus. It was supposed to be an obscenity trial, but in reality, it was kind of a racketeering trial where they tried to show the mob's involvement in the porn industry. Law enforcement in this, in this country was very, very upset that the mafia was making hundreds of millions of dollars off what they thought was, you know, disgusting, degrading filth. The trial showed that the Perinos were the prime movers in the porn business, that they had uh, produced and distributed Deep Throat, made millions of dollars on it, and were knee-deep in cash. And when the link between the mob and porn profits is made clear, it's an all-out scandal. Mayor Lindsay in New York City came and banned it. They pulled it out of the World Theater in Times Square, and it caused an uproar. When you face hard times together, you really get to know what somebody's made of. Shared adversity is the glue that bonds soldiers and fraternity brothers into lifelong friends. That didn't happen with the real brothers, Perino. Tony goes on the lam, leaving Brother Joe to face the music in Memphis. The blues, of course. The brothers are no longer on the same page because Anthony Perino Sr. had taken off while the Deep Throat trial was going on and Joe the Whale took over a lot of the distribution. The trial goes badly for the Perinos and everybody else. They all get convicted, even Tony, who's hiding out in Italy or on his yacht. The Perinos appeal the conviction. But here's where the dramatic personality difference between the brothers becomes a problem. Joe the Whale and his son became the day-to-day um, the -day people who were involved in picking up the money, collecting the money, distributing the, the, the films, and basically running the show for the Colombo crime family. It seems obvious that the last person you want minding the candy store is a 500-pound gluttonous moron. But Fat Tony and Butchie have no choice. They aren't there. And anyway, the job is pretty simple. It's the two Joseph's job to make sure everybody gets their cut. Tony, Butchie, and the Colombo family bosses. I think we're pretty well established that the whale and his son are greedy nincompoops, and even their fellow mobsters are onto them. There's going to be blood on the floor, and with this bunch, that ain't a metaphor. Joe Pirano and his son, Joe Jr., think their bosses are coming to meet them to hear how much money they all made on Deep Throat last year. In fact, the only ones joining them will be a pair of shotgun-toting hitmen. How is it that two of the Colombo family's best earners are being set up for a violent end? Very 
After the Memphis trial in 76, Joe DeWale and his son are left in charge of the Pirano family business. They've never been given any responsibility before, for good reason. They're greedy and not that smart. But now the smart guys are indisposed. Fat Tony's on the run, and Butchie's fighting a losing battle to keep his Hollywood dreams alive. Unfortunately, it's exposed that Bryanston Films are the mafia, and um, basically they close up shop. So Butchie's dream of, of having a, this big Hollywood film studio gets shut down. So Tony and Butchie are counting more than ever on their share of Deep Throat's profits. But those envelopes don't seem as thick as they ought to be. Especially considering that the Memphis trial did nothing but pump up Deep Throat's box office receipts. The controversial movie Deep Throat has returned to Fort Worth once again. Most of the convictions are overturned on appeal. And thanks to the attempts to ban it, Deep Throat is bigger than ever. It actually generated more money because they gave them publicity they couldn't get anywhere else. People were starting to talk about freedom of speech and First Amendment rights and, and fighting for sexual freedom. So people wanted to be part of the sexual revolution. And because the police had tried to stop the distribution of the film, people wanted to see it. You know, when things get censored, people want to see what's the big deal. Which means the Joes are getting even more stinking rich. Fat Tony and Butchie are on the outside. And they smell a rat. Just because you're in a room with a giant pile of money, it doesn't mean it's all yours. The whale and the sun start thinking. The bosses have no idea how much they're supposed to get. Why not send them two boxes instead of, say, three or four? Oops. You know, once you're getting the money, you think, well, it's mine, you know? He's not coming back. I can just spend it any way I want. <laughs> I mean, you know, if I was Anthony Perino, I probably would have sent guys to shoot him down, too. I mean, he was pissing the money away, you know? After a couple of years on the lamb, Fat Tony comes out of the cold. He's got to serve a little time, but he's OK with that. What he's not OK with is his brother playing him for a fool. When his brother came back, he wasn't too happy with the way Joe the Whale had been spending his money. Anthony Pirano felt that his brother and his nephew were stealing not only from the crime family, but stealing from him. Fat Tony's prison is in California, not far from Butchie. It should be no surprise that the topic of what to do about our thieving relatives comes up now and again. He sent his son to the Colombo family hierarchy to complain that his brother was stealing money from him. Yeah, hey, Jim, thanks for coming. He said, my father wants you guys to know what's going on. He wants my Uncle Joe and my cousin Joey to pay, pay for this with their lives. The Colombo bosses are no strangers to whacking their own. For them, putting bullets in the brains of friends and colleagues is all in a day's work. The Colombo crime family has always been uh, a fractious, violent family that uh, feasted on uh, violence against uh, itself. As bad of an image as I had of the Piranos, and as much as I disliked them all, I still didn't think that they were capable of doing anything like that. I don't think that a, a human being could ever act that way, to, to go in and to put his brother and his nephew on the line and ask for their lives for, for stealing money was unbelievable to me. The Pirano hits a weird one for sure. For fratricide or no, it seems like a good management plan. Yeah, 
The Columbo interest in the hit was money. They didn't care if you're stealing from the brother. If you're stealing from the brother, you're stealing from us. You don't go into the mafia and not know that if you do that, you're going to get whacked, you know? That's just, you know, it's like ripping off a drug dealer, you know? Like, someone's going to, you're, you're going to pay for it. The decision is made. Joe the Whale and his son are to be killed. The hit needs to be planned, of course. But how hard can it be to whack the whale? Clearly, the Colombo family reading group has not gotten around to Moby Dick. Captain Ahab, he had a hard time of it. November 1981. Joseph the Whale Pirano is ambushed in his easy chair and riddled with five 38 caliber bullets. It looks like the Colombo family's problem is taken care of. But they're as surprised as everybody else. They didn't order this hit. The question is, who did? So who shot the whale? Well, it wasn't the Colombos. It was Joe Jr. He's pissed off because his dad is sleeping with Jr.'s wife's mother. You can't make this stuff up. When Joe Jr. found out about it, he felt dishonored by the father, and he tried to kill him. It turns out the whale's biggest talent is absorbing lead. Now, how did the whale survive five point-blank slugs from a 38? There's a reason Ahab didn't go after Moby Dick with a handgun. There are a lot of places for a bullet to go in a wall of blubber. Junior slugs didn't hit anything vital or even important. The whale was wearing a permanent bulletproof vest, which was the two or 300 pounds of fat that he carried on his belly. When the sun shot him, the son ran away, and the rest of the family and the people in the house decided that they would take Joe to Whale and carry him outside, help him walk down the steps outside, and lay him down in the street and say that somebody tried to rob him so that the cops wouldn't know that the son tried to kill him. When the police show up to ask who shot him, the Whale gives them a cock and bull story. Something about, you know, getting mugged. They thinking that it was a mob hit or something to do with the Colombo crime family. And Joe the Whale and his family stick into the story that a couple of guys had with guns try to rob him. Lying to cops is protocol for any mafiosi, but lying to your bosses, that you don't do. A few days later, members of the Colombo family went to visit the whale in the hospital and asked him what had happened. And he told the story again that he'd been robbed by a black man and the black man had run off. But the story had already traveled through the grapevine and gotten to the administration. Lying to mob bosses is a very bad move. When the whale tries to cover up his sleazy rolls in the hay with his son's mother-in-law, the Columbos conclude that he's a lying dirtbag. They're dirtbags too, of course, but they hate liars. And the mother-in-law thing? <laughs> Joe the whale's skeevy sex life is actually a big worry for the Colombo bosses. They might be homicidal thugs who scoff at G-men, but the mob is an awful lot like junior high school. And every Colombo's nightmare is a giggling Gambino. There was an ego amongst all the families. They wanted the other families to have respect for them. You know, and if they put up with some kind of behavior or nonsense like that, the other families would look down upon them, or they'd laugh behind their back. And they were very paranoid about being laughed at. So for reasons of pride and greed, the Colombos now really wanted two Joseph Piranos stuffed into oversized coffins. They were multi-offenders. Was all over the place that the son tried to kill the father. The father was messing around with his mother-in-law. 
it was an embarrassment for the Colombo family, really. And then you top it all off with Joe and his son are stealing money, and some of that money belongs to the boss. That pretty much sealed their fate. When the boss is going to wind up with more money, you're in a lot of trouble. The job calls for someone who knows them really well. Who better than their crewmate, Big Sal Michiota? I got called to a meeting uh, on Avenue U and East 4th Street. There was a social club there. And I remember, oh, geez, you know, what the f is this all about? You know, anytime I get called, come to the club, we got to talk to you. Something has to be done. And I'm going to be the one to do it. Big Sal meets with his boss, Joe Tomasello. You know, the first thing out of Joe T's mouth was, Joe Pirano and his son. And I said, oh, man, why? So, well, it's a long story, but they got to go. Sal doesn't actually kill for a living. He's a loan shark. But part of the deal of being in the mob is that when the boss tells you to do a messy job, you do it. Sal had a reputation as the kind of guy, if you give him a job to kill somebody, he would get it done. Just cause you can get it done doesn't mean you like it. It was just a terrible thing. I mean, taking a life is not an easy thing to do. I'm sick that I have to be involved in it. Um, naturally, by now, I already know that I have to do whatever I'm told, although I'll wind up getting killed myself. It's not an easy time. It's a very stressful situation. A little anxiety makes for a good hitman. You fuss over the details. Planning a mob hit is not as easy as you might think. Joe the Whale had already survived five slugs from his son's 38. Clearly, they'll need serious firepower. Big guys like that, you want to put them down. You know, you're looking for shots to, to knock them down, knock them off their feet. And then once they're down, you can do whatever you want with them. A shotgun with the double O buck in it, wow. Untold damage. It hits you and takes your insides right out of you. So it, that was the gun of choice. As any host knows, it's important that your guests feel comfortable. That's doubly true if you're planning to eviscerate them with shotguns. We had to think along the lines of bringing them someplace where they would be comfortable. So we figured that we would direct them to a place where they were going to meet with the administration and everything was going to be OK. The ruse is a year-end meeting to report on Deep Thrills royalties. Finding just the right location is the key thing. So Sal goes house hunting. We decided to just pick a place at random, and we looked for a spot that would appeal to all of us. We had to do it in a place and in a time where it would make them feel comfortable and they wouldn't worry about what we were going to do to them. You know, I mean, you got to remember, if anything tips them off, it's a big problem. They're not regular people. I mean, they're killers, too. You know, they could just as easily kill us as we could kill them. We picked a spot that would look like it was made for this. We clocked the whole neighborhood. There was never anybody out. He finds his dream house on Lake Street in Gravesend, Brooklyn. It's a block away from a train station, and it's very noisy with the trains. He doesn't need to look inside. It's the porch he's after. Once they were on the steps, they would belong to us. I mean, there was nothing, nowhere they could go. They either had to go up or come down. And they were pretty much trapped. Sal doesn't ask the owner's permission. Why would he? I'd like to pop a pornographer on your porch can lead to some awkward questions. For example, are you going to clean it up after? In fact, 
Lugging a dead whale back to the car is not in the plan. You can't kill them in a house and try to bury them. I mean, look at the size of them. One guy is 500 pounds, and the other guy is, you know, another big guy, six foot three, six foot four. Now nah, we'll have to do it. We'll have to leave them in the street. January 4th, 1982. A car comes to the Del Rio diner and picks up Joe the Whale and Joe Jr. Father and son are still at odds over the mother-in-law attempted murder thing. But business is business. They think they're in for another dull evening of hiding income from their bosses. There will be a reckoning tonight, but the ledges have been closed. We were parked down the street. As soon as the car pulled up with them, we waited about a minute till they got like 20 feet ahead of us, 30 feet ahead of us, and we started creeping slowly in the car that we were in. It's the 11th day of Christmas, and it's time to pay the pipers. January 1982. When Joe the Whale and his son Joe Jr. arrive for their meeting with their mob bosses, everything seems hunky-dory. They had no idea what was going to happen to them, because they walked up the stairs of that house like nothing was going on. They've been cheating the Colombo family and their own kin for years. As far as they know, no one has ever noticed. Now, here's the problem. The way you find out they've caught you with your hand in the cookie jar is very abrupt. The timing was perfect. When the son made us getting out of the car with the shotguns, he started running across the stoop. But it was too late for him. Your adrenaline starts taking over. You know, you have that invincible high feeling. You know, every time you do something like this, your life is on the line. I mean, cops could pull up, anything could happen. You could wind up in a shootout. You could get killed, you could get arrested. Your whole life could change in five seconds. It was a pretty, pretty precarious situation. The father never got to the door. He got shot, and he laid there, never moved. We were sure that they were both dead. You know, like I was in survival mode. I wanted to get it done, get in the car, and get out of there. And then on the way home, I was listening to the radio on the car. And I heard that two people were fatally wounded in Brooklyn, and there was a, a mob hit. And so I went to bed thinking, job well done. Not quite. Joe Jr. is dead. The whale, on the other hand, has survived yet again. He is not the second casualty. The second victim is Veronica Zara, a social worker and the former nun. She's who really lived at 431 Lake Street with her husband, Lewis. Veronica was bringing laundry from upstairs to downstairs, and one of the pellets of the shotgun blast hit her in the head. She fell and died instantly. Oh, man, I was, I was in shock. At first, I was sick to death. It was bad enough that I was doing these things, you know, to people in my life. But when it, a, a person that has absolutely nothing to do with this gets killed, it's devastating. Joe the Whale isn't unscathed this time. He's paralyzed. The cops hope he'll at least cough up the name of the people who murdered his son. He would never cooperate with anybody or say anything. He wouldn't say who picked him up at the diner. He, wouldn't, he wasn't talking about anything. His silence buys the Whale a pass from the Columbos who suspect that 
he might just be immortal. He kept his mouth shut and was never really targeted again by the crime family. He was happy to get out with his life and basically uh, disappear from view. News of the slaying of a former nun makes headlines. But with the whale holding his tongue, investigators get nowhere. There were no arrests. There were no suspects. There were a number of unsolved murders, and that was just one of them. Deep Throat might have changed the world of porn, but nobody involved in it ended up better off. Linda Lovelace seesaws between a porn career and anti-porn activism until she dies in a car wreck. The guy who invented the porn feature, Gerard Damiano, ends up broke in a Florida trailer park. And it was something that troubled him to the end of his life to see you know, these people that were essentially murderers make hundreds of millions of dollars where you know he did everything creatively to make this film and walked away with very little almost nothing the whale wasn't immortal he lasts a few years but complications from his wounds eventually take him to that meeting with his maker brother tony nephew butchie and the Columbos reclaim Deep Throat's revenues. But it isn't long after that, home videos come along. Porn becomes mainstream. The big profits are gone, and the Pirano family just fades into memory. Hitman Sal Michiota gets out of the mob in 1993. He takes the stand against his former gangster pals. Sal spends a few years behind bars, but he's out now. I've never seen this film, Deep Throat. I don't want to see it. To me, it's, it's absolutely nothing. It's brought nothing but trouble and heartache to a lot of people. And Big Sal counts himself as one of them. He doesn't know if it was his shot that ended the life of Veronica Zara. In the end, he knows it really doesn't matter. It's on him. And it doesn't sit well. I pray for forgiveness, and I pray for her. And she was a good person that did good for people. And I had a hand in her demise. And it kills me. And, you know, I deal with it every day. It hurts me every day. When theater owner Larry Austin meets James Van Sickle, he thinks he's found the man of his dreams. Larry thought he was just a gift of the gods, you know. Unfortunately, not every Hollywood tale has a happy ending. At a certain point, it was clear that relations between the two became strained. This is the true story of a volatile friendship between a hustler. He had to deceive these people into believing that he actually cared for them. And a man living out his fantasies. The last thing he said to me is, God will protect me. There you are. <laughs> My name is Steve Sharippa. I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. I've seen good people turn bad and bad people turn worse. Some took contracts to carry out a hit. Some were victims of a hit. To hitmen, life and death is just part of the business. It's nothing personal. Hollywood, 1997. Hitman Christian Rodriguez is dressed like a villain from a old-time movie. And Lawrence Austin, an old man who loves those timeless classics, is about to die. His murder has been arranged by the young man he loves, James Van Sickle. 
The story of Larry Austin and James Van Sickle is a tale of two dreamers. It's a Hollywood love story and a cautionary tale. You see, you never know what a person's fantasy really is until they decide you're it. Larry longs for a beautiful young lover, but James has dreams of his own. Both their dreams come true. So why is this story a tragedy? Thank you for coming. Enjoy the show. Larry owns the Silent Movie Theater, a local landmark devoted to keeping Hollywood's history alive. Larry Austin liked being very unique. Uh, who else was doing silent films? He just loved the attention. He had many people would show up and to sit in the theater that were major stars of, of today. And he just loved that. Inside his theater, he's a living connection to those glorious days. We would have this, this routine at the, at the beginning of each evening uh, that he would come down the aisle while I played Pomp and Circumstance. He was full of Pomp and Circumstance. But then on the other hand, it reflected that he thought he was presenting something important. And he was. He was. Welcome, everyone, to the world's only silent movie theater. Larry Austin loved being a showman. He loved going in front of the audience and just talking and introducing the film. He told me that his family was involved with early Hollywood. He said his father was a character actor and his mother was the head seamstress for Cecil B. DeMille. And I thought, wow. Austin loves Hollywood traditions, like making up your own backstory. Austin says his dad was silent movie actor William Austin. Not so. And his mom, well, she never saw the stitch for Cecil B. anyone. But in Hollywood, it's all in the presentation. Act the part, and it's yours. Tonight, we're going to show Sunrise. There's only one missing piece, his very own leading man. One night, he appears, Larry's Nighthawk in shining armor, James Van Sickle. Larry Austin first met James through a mutual friend. When Larry asked for help to, to paint the theater, he uh, brought James along. Here is this great big guy who probably was Stanley stunning when he went to the gym every day. Broad shoulders and big arms, handsome face, all American boy, but large economy size, you know. James reminded me like of a, of a country boy, you know, uh, a farm boy. Um, he was always smiling, kind of giving everyone the once over. He was such a flirt. He was a flirt with apparently everybody. James Van Sickle might not be everybody's idea of a dreamboat, but he is Larry's. And Larry told me, he looked at him and said, wow, he'd like to have him. He's such a hunk. There may be some guys whose heads are turned by a beautiful creature who is 40 years younger. Larry Austin is not one of them. Larry's a lonely 67-year-old man. James is a 27-year-old ex-con hustler looking for a sugar daddy. Cupid, draw back your bow. Well, it in a way is touching because at this stage, James would have had a hard time making it as a hustler because he was too out of shape, you know. It took somebody with the loneliness and the passion and the imagination to still see him as Hercules, let's say. Larry Austin's dreams are coming true. With his new boy toy, it looks like he really has it all. His first passion the silent movie theater doesn't make Larry a fortune, but he loves the work. He'd had hundreds of old silent movie reels. Some of them were uh, original, one of a kind, uh, on the old celluloid. It's a very beautiful art form that you have to express this and that with your hands, your eyes, gestures. 
Some things are much more powerful if they're revealed by an image than a word. Larry Austin had the great joy of, of acquiring a library, building that library up, building, building, building. And he loved finding the rarest titles he could find and showing them to the audience. He, he just loved that. Larry Austin's uh, first touch into you know, showing silent films to an audience was at the Mormon church. And he just enjoyed it so much. At the beginning, James Van Sickle is just what a crumbling old theater needs. He could do things that Larry could not do. Larry did not like to get his hands dirty. James was great to handle things that uh, needed to be taken care of. James, this is wonderful. What could be better than a helpful hunk? I mean, it was a strong sexual attraction, and Larry thought he was just a gift of the gods, you know. It doesn't take Larry long to decide James would be great around the house, too. James. It was just, just a relationship of, 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 of lust. You're smelling good. Here is a much younger guy who had done some hustling and had latched on to this much older man who had fallen hard for him. And it's, it's a classic recipe for big trouble. Larry has no idea who he's lured into his bedroom. His young lover is fresh out of the pen. Six years for beating an older gay lover half to death. This was a, another elderly gentleman, very similar to Lawrence Austin, wealthy, uh, gay. He took uh, James in and bought him everything, you know, that he had wanted, treated him very well. One day, James got angry at something that this victim had said and uh, went into his room and hit him in the head with a hammer. He put out at some level sexually to these guys to satisfy them and to draw them into a relationship with him and apparently succeeded quite well. And yet at the same time, he entertained a secret hatred. In his first ever interview, James reveals what he really thinks about old gay men who put the moves on young guys. Well, I think they're all scum, okay? They're scum of this earth, and I would try to win their trust, all right, to a certain extent to where I could get within their residence, you know, get them alone to where I could do what I felt I needed to do to them in order to punish them. For now, Larry's ignorance is bliss. Larry loved to do for James, as Mae West would say, you know, doing for him. He just idolized him and whatever he could possibly do, you know, buying types of foods that he liked. He was always thinking of something to get James. And I thought, oh boy, you know, he's in love. I'm hungry for something. James in, in, in the relationship with Larry was very dominant. Larry liked that. He liked someone strong around him. People like Austin want to have people like James sort of dominate them sexually. James had to provide that level of sexual service to keep a guy like Austin on the hook. Is James as into Larry as much as Larry lusts for James? Not really. James doesn't see his involvement with Larry as a relationship. It's a job. He acts like a loving partner, and in exchange, he gets a nice lifestyle and some cash in his pocket. There's a word for what James is doing. So Hustling is the politest one. James is good at it. How good? Well, Larry will never know. But James isn't even gay. When I would ask him, did he enjoy this, it was clear he did not. He comes across to me as a straight guy. 
he professes personally to be offended at gayness, and yet he engages in it. It's almost like he's outside of the relationship. He sees the relationship, but he's personally removing himself at a distance from it. He's not accepting that him and Austin were partners, for example, sexually or personally. But when you get closer and say, you know, what about how did you did you hug? Did you love? I mean, there's a rejection by James to me of all that. It's I'm just like you. I'm a, I'm a studly guy. James Van Sickle is not at all whom he appears to be. Larry Austin's been making pillow talk with a time bomb. Friday, January 17, 1997. Hollywood silent movie theater is playing Sunrise, a romantic drama built around a murderous plot. Hitman Chris Rodriguez is at the theater to turn a real love story into a real murder. It's not how a romance is supposed to end with a hired killer. Rewind seven years and Larry really believes his boy toy loves and admires him. He thinks James shares his passion for old movies. It's an act. He had no interest in film whatsoever. He pretended like he liked the silent movies and he liked, he had a love for the film. And he played to Mr. Austin's vast ego. He liked to think that he knew everything about silent movies and even some of the stars. He said he had met some of the stars, Mary Pickford and I think Buster Keaton and some of the other silent movie people. Well, he liked to think of himself as a, of a connoisseur. Stroking egos is child's play for any hustler. What's hard for James is taking orders. He's working at the theater, and Larry's the boss. James, we have some problems. When James was working in the theater, it was Larry was in charge. I mean, it, he, it was his show place. Everything went by Larry. Larry's not so good on the labor relations front. For one thing, he doesn't pay James, treats him like a kid, gives him spending money and presents. Larry expects James to be happy with this arrangement, to love him for his firm but kindly ways. Yeah, well, Larry's in dreamland. If he woke up, he might see the writing on the wall. Austin was a control freak, and he liked to keep Van Sickle controlled. He would give him just enough money to exist on, but never enough to really do anything with. You'll be paid. If you're starting to think Larry's got blinders on, you're fish. dead right. He thinks all James needs is some firm guidance. <sighs> There's a big problem with treating James Van Sickle like a kid. I mean, he's the last person on earth you want to remind of his childhood. He started out in Nebraska, a great place, unless you're poor and not even your family wants you. You see, James isn't living his dream, not even close. He's running from his nightmare. James grew up in a, in a troubled household, shall we say. Uh, his earliest memories are of, of severe beatings and mistreatment. He was made to feel ultimately like he was undesired. When his mom and dad split up and mom remarries, life gets way worse. His new stepfather has his own kids and the blended family is toxic. James tells us what that was like. My early childhood was very, very difficult. We were, you know, extremely poor people. And so there was a little bit of sibling disparity. Someone has to go, and it's James. 
It was a, it was a heart-wrenching moment. Uh, I remember everybody was crying, and I was shaking like a leaf. It terrified me. And I was begging not to go. I blame myself for letting him go. I shouldn't have let him go. James is handed off to a Christian home for kids whose parents don't want or can't afford them. But the kids there don't learn to fear God nearly as much as they live in terror of the people who work there. We thought they were such good people, and these people were molesting my son. There was six perversions that went on, OK? It first began with the oral population. Um, it wasn't till my 13th year was when he started going in a different direction. This guy was a monster. And uh, there was no way you could escape him at my age. These people were supposed to be Christian people, and they weren't. You don't do this to children. James is 10 when he's put in the children's home. He's 15 when he gets out. Now, those are important years for a kid. And for all of them, he is a sexual plaything for one of the authority figures there. So when other kids are learning the three R's, James is learning that if you satisfy someone's lust, they treat you better. And all you lose is your innocence and your dignity. He was out of control. He was wild. He was just, I mean, just like something would trip his mind, and he would lose it. As soon as he's old enough, Van Sickle joins the Marines. He's angry and unstable. He said in the Marines that there was people that were the same as, as his molester. He's soon discharged and ends up on the streets of LA. The only real skill he's got is what he learned in that children's home. You can trade your body for a meal and a warm bed. James Van Sickle becomes a hustler. He was doing sexual favors with men to survive. To survive? or to take revenge. That older gay lover he beat up wasn't the only one. A great many hustlers start out as straight, but because they are straight, they get confused because the John is the only one who is really showing them affection. And they can build up a great deal of anger and resentment and frustration. What is a hustler, really? I've known quite a few over the years. I'll tell you, they're stick-up artists whose weapon is charm. They convince you that you want to give them what they're demanding. James, as a person, just rubbed me the wrong way. And I can tell a user right from the get-go, uh, someone that looks like he's going to be scamming somebody. And he just came off that way, that he was just out for himself. And watch out. After two years with Larry Austin, James' biggest beef is he's still not getting paid. James, what are you doing? He solves that with direct action. Just uh, getting a little fight. At a certain point, it was clear that relations between the, the two became strained, and it was over money. Love of money, the root of all evil. But James Van Sickle isn't the only one in this odd couple romance with the shady past. Larry spent a couple of years in the pen himself. Wait a second. Larry's an ex-con, too? As a matter of fact, he is. It's part of his real backstory. You see, before he reinvents himself as a Hollywood aristocrat, Larry Austin is an accountant who has a habit of pocketing other people's money. A habit that lands him two years for embezzlement. Does Larry reform in prison or just get more clever? And how did he come to own the silent movie theater in the first place? 
it was owned by a little old lady. Somehow, Larry gets her to hand over the keys. Larry Austin, there was a shady element to him. I think there was some stretching of the truth on a lot of things of how he got her to sign it over to him. If it was a scam, he got away with it. Now he's the keeper of Hollywood's history. He's a prosperous businessman. Larry's good at getting what he wants, and keeping his young lover happy doesn't seem too hard. Larry and James, two hustlers chasing their dreams. Like this one. How could that lead to conflict? It's good. Larry gives James a cushy life and a new truck. What more could he want? Problem. This life comes with strings. The truck is in Larry's name. When James cuts those ties and gets himself a real job, he does pretty well. He was well liked. He was making decent money. He was well thought of as a worker. He manages a small lighting factory. He hires a guy named Christian Rodriguez to do the shipping. Remember, Chris, we haven't seen the last of him. Rodriguez was a poor kid who was a little bit slow. He was just a simple person. He was married, he had children. Putting lamps in boxes is a little too complicated for Chris. He gets fired. Great. All the while, Larry's been enticing James to come back to the theater. He finally gets his way by offering him a share of the business and the job of projectionist. James tries to control his temper. It can't last. I tried for several years to maintain. I would totally destroy personal property. I mean, it was like a tug of war type thing with me. Larry called me and said, oh, Michael, James is acting up again. I said, what's wrong? He said, oh, he, 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 he said that he wanted money, and he said if he didn't, he was going to break things. What are you doing? You're destroying my treasure. You animal. You animal. If Larry is still thinking James is his dream come true, he's got some issues of his own. And if he thinks his patience is the solution to Van Sickle's anger? He's not a dreamer. He's delusional. It's a fine line, but crossing it can get you hurt. What begins as a normal evening at Hollywood's silent movie theater is soon going to be very unsilent, thanks to the 357 that first-time hitman Christian Rodriguez has brought to the show. In fact, Rodriguez will be the show, and the audience will never forget it. Before that fateful night, James Van Sickle and Larry Austin are lovers who are heading in different directions. Larry's in love. Trouble is, his young lover is scarred and damaged, and Larry is rubbing salt in his wounds. James thought he had found himself a sugar daddy, but the taste has gone bitter. They've been together six years now. A long, bumpy road. The relationship was disintegrating him at this point. Larry had turned him down for some hunk of money. I was standing outside of the theater once um, before the show, and he came out. He seemed to be very angry, mad at Lawrence. And he said something to the effect that, well, that old man better watch out because he may wind up dead one day. James was a person that you would definitely keep arm's length at. I mean, he was friendly, but again, when you talk to him more, he revealed a little bit of a sociopathic streak that you would say, is he really kidding or is he serious about what he's saying? And you would, wouldn't want to get too friendly with him. Larry! I want my money! 
He recruits a couple of thugs to help him rob the theater. You're robbing me? James, come back! James really became unsettling when he attempted to rob the theater. That was really out there and scary. James clearly has problems with impulse control, but he isn't stupid. He comes back contrite and with a peace offering. Yeah. James. The other guys made me do it, he says. Oh, wow. Larry buys it. Rudolph. The bad guys forced James to rob the silent movie theater? I mean, how likely is that? You may not believe it, but Larry does, or he pretends to. That way, the whole conflict could get swept under the rug. Denial. It can be a fatal disease. How do you like that, eh? Larry really was in love with him, and he was looking for ways to forgive him, too. I mean, it was very sad and complicated and volatile, volatile, volatile. It was definitely like a moth going to a flame. He just couldn't stay away. Austin found James compelling enough to keep him around, even though he was smelling the danger. Tells you there's something going on here at a, at a sexual, emotional level that's not easy to unwind. You would be a star. To calm the waters, Larry surprises James with what he's always dreamt of, financial security. He writes a will naming James as his sole heir. The theater and film archive are worth a million dollars. Austin must have felt that kind of emotional warmth towards James. Uh, how else do you envision him wanting to give what remained of his, uh, you know, his, his financial empire to James upon his demise? Trouble is, to James, Larry is now worth more dead than alive. Obviously, this was not uh, well considered, for sure. Hey, good, good morning. morning, James. How are you? By morning, Larry realizes he's made a bad move. Uh, that will. Keep it somewhere safe. <laughs> it's safe? Right here. Austin's decision to put James on the will is what probably triggered James into thinking, now I can now I can take advantage of this guy fully the way I really want to. It might have been his death knell. It was the culmination of a lot of effort by James to get there, and that success at seeing himself now empowered financially by Austin, let him begin thinking, now I can get rid of this guy. For Larry Austin, when the excitement simmers down, he relaxes. Everything's back to normal. Only Larry's normal is James's living hell. With the will in his pocket, the brakes are off on James's rage. You're a fool! I'm tired of it! Hey, you're a middle! Son of a... You're a... Finally, one night, they got into this heated, heated fight, and James had taken a, a phone cord and wrapped it around his neck, and Larry thought he was going to die. I did almost kill him, kind of put the brakes on what I really wanted to do to this person. It's hard to explain what goes through my mind. What doesn't go through his mind is that physically attacking someone is a crime. It's called assault. Larry calls the cops, but then drops the charges. I said, you know, I'm beginning to worry about this situation, Larry. You know, I'm, you know, I'm beginning to get afraid for you. This is not good, and you really need to take steps to protect yourself. Larry didn't want to recognize the really true danger that he was in, that was escalating by the minute. He said to me, as God will protect me.
James is now afraid that last attack might have scared Larry into dumping him. He's got to act fast. Panic. That's how a hustler with a violent temper becomes a guy who can plot a cold-blooded murder. So James decides Larry Austin needs to die. That way, he'll get everything he needs from him. Vengeance and a small fortune. He decides a robbery gone bad is the way to go. And he won't do it himself. He'll hire a hitman. But who can he recruit to pull the trigger? Who's desperate enough to kill an old man for cash? How about the dim bulb from the lighting store? Chris Rodriguez? He's got a family to feed and no marketable skills. Perfect. I don't know if you can say I snapped is that I had a, a desire, an overwhelming desire to punish Lawrence Austin, okay? And uh, I began talking about it to friends, you know, anybody that would listen, I would, uh, man, I hate this person, man, this person's a scumbag. He does a lot more than call them bad names. He gives Rodriguez a detailed plan. Van Sickle told him almost everything to do, and whatever Van Sickle would tell Christian to do, that's what Christian would do. James told Christian, look, you know, if we get this to happen, we're both going to be in, in clover. I'm going to have all this money, and, and you'll be my sidekick, and we'll, we'll go through life uh, much better off than we are now. So Larry Austin, the keeper of Hollywood's history, is about to become part of it, a real-life tragedy, just a few blocks south of the boulevard of broken dreams. Rodriguez he had no criminal history, but once Van Sickle planted that seed into him with the money, it just ate him up until he decided to go ahead and kill for it. So, Chris Rodriguez sees his dream coming true. Before, he couldn't hold on to a job. Now all he's got to do is kill a guy and he's on easy street, for most people. This is where your conscience or your better judgment would kick in and say, whoa, this is wrong. This is a bad idea. Doesn't happen. My sense of Rodriguez is he just never really gave this the kind of thought it needed. How would he have ever envisioned himself succeeding at this process? I see Chris Rodriguez as an incredibly weak-minded individual. Larry Austin could see what's coming. His dream crumbling into a nightmare. Larry had told me, like, uh, probably about two weeks or three weeks before he was murdered, that um, he was frightened of James. And he said that he has had a cell phone now because he was afraid that James was going to be cutting the phone wires and Larry couldn't call for help. He told me that anything happened to him, point the finger at James. Now that he has a plan, James doesn't mind pretending to be the obedient boy taunt, so he keeps a lid on his temper. This real estate will soon be his and he'll be rich. And that powerful exploiter, Larry Austin, he soon will get what he deserves. Enjoy the show. He's a scumbag, okay? And I knew I couldn't do it, okay? I mean, if I did it, everybody would know. I thought about doing something, you know, in the theater, doing it dramatic, all kinds of things. Van Sickle's actually gone way further than just musing about it. He's justified to himself that Larry deserves to die. His true goal is an avenging angel kind of attitude towards people like Austin for the purpose of paying back for the past history in his own life. James picks Friday, January 17th, 1997, as the day for Larry to be killed. It'll be busy, and Austin will be distracted. On Tuesday, he goes over the plan with Chris Rodriguez. The hitman will act like he's robbing the place. Rodriguez gets a gun. No money. 
It was almost unbelievable that he would have done this with nothing down. And he thought, honestly, that Van Sickle was going to paint. I said, so in other words, you did all this on credit. You, you did this all on credit. Three nights later, Chris Rodriguez heads to the theater. This is the whole theatrics of, 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 and the dynamics of how Van Sickle was. He was a control person also, and he wanted this to be dramatic. And he thought, if he wears all dark clothes, maybe he can get away easier. People won't recognize him as quick. We started the show as usual. Uh, he would come down. We did Pomp and Circumstance, and he introduced the show. Lawrence Austin welcomes the silent movie audience to the world. for the very last time. Tonight, Larry Austin will fall victim to a masterpiece of foolishness. Chris Rodriguez isn't playing out some twisted dream of his own. He's a simpleton, and he's got a simple plan. He's going to kill old guy, get money, feed kids. James Van Sickle is more complicated, but his judgment is clouded. He's so angry, he can't see Larry isn't really the guy who hurt him. And Larry Austin, well, he thinks everything's great. Three people, three distorted views of reality. That's how dreams become nightmares. We went through the first uh, short, and then we went into the second movie, which was called School Days, and it was a uh, comedy starring Larry Seaman. Rodriguez has never shot anyone. It's his debut, and he's got stage fright. Uh, he was very nervous. That at one time he got up, he went into the restroom, and he was sweating a little bit. He didn't know if he was going to go through with it, but then he started thinking about his wife and his kids. He didn't have any diapers and no money, and that pushed him over to make him go ahead and do it. Got up, he went to the candy counter. I, I, I need to see your manager. He said he wanted uh, to buy a, a block of tickets for a future performance. Gentlemen, and about that same time, Mr. Austin uh, walked up to the counter. Yes, sir, how can I help? And then that's when Rodriguez pulled a gun and demanded the money. There you are. Mr. Austin complied, absolutely started rounding up the money, putting it in a paper bag, and Rodriguez kind of leaned over the counter, got a little closer, pointed the gun straight out as far as he could, right up to Austin's head. Hurry up! <laughs> Larry Austin thinks he's being robbed. It's his last delusion. Lawrence Austin loves silent movies. He loves living in their dreamy world. And when he dies, it's just like one of them. Not a word, all action. Tonight, inside a theater in Hollywood, there'll be a murder that will end several dreams. It won't be on the screen, and it won't be silent. Hurry up! <laughs> From five feet, you could miss if you're nervous. Two inches, five inches, right in the head, you're not gonna miss. It was more important that he had diapers and rent than Mr. Austin had a life. At that point, he became a stone cold killer. The script says no witnesses. Too bad for ticket girl, Mary Giles. He turned to Mary and shot her point blank. <laughs> Miraculously, her wound is not fatal. I believe it was God's miracle. Just a twist of her body, a certain centimeter or an inch or, you know. I heard a series of, of uh, pops coming from the lobby, and I had thought that someone was firing off firecrackers. 
And so I had turned around and I stopped playing. I heard uh, a few more pops and then I see a man running down this aisle, shooting, shooting over his head, just shooting wildly. He ran down an alley and to his car, which he had parked a couple blocks away. After he went out the back door, I ran up to the lobby, and that's where I saw Mary. And there was Lawrence there, and he was shot through the eye. John Miller is the first detective on the scene. Now, originally, we thought it was a robbery. I had all the signs of robbery with the money, with the victim being shot behind the counter. The strange thing about it was he was shot point blank. I mean, obviously, killed him instantly. But then he was shot twice more in the leg, uh, which didn't quite make sense to us. The projectionist seems eager to help. He told us that, you know, he was in the projection booth. He heard the shots. He pushed the alarm, uh, but he didn't see anything. By the time he said, by the time he got out, everything was over. But he does hold something back. He didn't mention anything about it relationship with, with uh, Austin. He said they were good friends and that he admired him because they both had this love for silent movies. Even though he apparently hated Austin enough to want him to die, he, he tried to manipulate this into a situation where it appeared that he was an innocent uh, witness to this terrible crime and not the perpetrator. An hour or so after the murder, uh, James had come up to me and said, we, we need to reopen this theater and run it as Lawrence had always run it before. And well, it'll be you and me, Dean. And uh, which I thought was kind of strange to say that since his lover had just been murdered. At Larry's funeral, James acts as a pallbearer. It's the end of a great era. I mean, we, we lost an individual that was dedicated to preserving the silent movies, the, the birth of the industry. And um, he's gone. The next day, when Detective Miller searches Austin's apartment, he finds the will. We thought, well, that was kind of strange that he would write a will, and then it would be in the computer, and he would leave everything to Van Sickle, who at that time we only knew as just his projectionist. So the cops have their suspicions about James Van Sickle, but nothing really to go on. The real break comes when Mary Giles describes the shooter to a police sketch artist. She's got an eye for detail, that girl, I'll tell you. This sketch is so dead on that as soon as it hits the papers, Chris Rodriguez's own relatives call the cops. At Chris's place, they find evidence that ties him to James. Rodriguez confesses in a heartbeat, James is arrested, and Detective Miller's dream comes true. What do detectives dream about? Cases that solve themselves. Our investigation determined that Van Sickle, who was designated as the sole beneficiary of Mr. Austin's estate, which is valued in excess of $1 million, hired Rodriguez to kill Austin for approximately $25,000. When James was arrested, I was shocked and I just felt tremendous sadness all around. I felt sad for him, sad, sad for Larry, sad for the theater, sad for the patrons. Both men are found guilty of murder. But when the jury hears what James Van Sickle's childhood was like, they take pity on him. Him and Chris Rodriguez suspend the death penalty. They both get life without parole. To this day, Van Sickle says he's innocent. Never, never did it. I did not hire this guy to do it. No one believes him. 
which is why he's speaking to us now from a California prison. James Van Sickle's mother serves her own life sentence, thinking of how different things could have been. I think he was a victim of his mind. He had so much anger that um, he was hurting people. I just want some peace for my son. There's little chance of that. Sorry as you might feel about a guy's lost youth, it's no excuse for cold-blooded murder. Larry Austin did not deserve to die. He brought a lot of happiness to people, and I, I think Larry would be appreciative that a lot of people can walk away and say they were glad that Larry ran the silent theater. You and I would call it a sponge bath. To pharmacist Mark Foster, it's a sacrament, last rites. In a few hours, Foster will be dead. The man bathing him is Greg Friesner. He'll be the guy who pulls the trigger. The strange thing is, Mark's murder is his own idea. Yeah, you heard me. This story is, well, unusual. It's a wild yarn of how the mild-mannered guy behind the prescription counter has a secret life. And in that life, he is the leader of his very own voodoo sex cult. Got your attention? Yeah, I thought so. So make yourself comfortable, because, boy, have I got a tale to tell you. My name is Steve Sharippa. I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. I've seen good people turn bad and bad people turn worse. Some took contracts to carry out a hit. Some were victims of a hit. To hit men, life and death is just part of the business. It's nothing personal. Like many a strange story, Mark Foster starts in an ordinary place. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Trust me, even Minneapolis has a dark underbelly. Minneapolis is, in general, a very good town. However, you never know what's lurking behind the next corner, if it's a McDonald's or a voodoo cult. In the history of Minneapolis, you might never find anyone with a weirder secret than Mark Foster's. On the surface, he's a charming local businessman. Nice house, a few kids. Unremarkable, right? Ah, uh, no. Nah. Pay attention, because this story is going to get crazy real quick. My father was a phenomenal character. He was like somebody you'd never ever met in your entire life. He was very off the wall. I loved my dad a lot. Mark and his wife were also standing parents for his nephew, Frank, whose mother died when he was a kid. Frank's not his real name, by the way. He asked us to call him that. I felt very loved by my uncle. He went out of his way to make me feel like I was a very special person and part of his family. He would read my palms and do tarot readings on me and stuff. See what you got. I looked at it more like a joke than anything else. The Fosters fit right into their neighborhood of God-fearing, wholesome people. They worship at the Seventh-day Adventist church. But for Foster, his church doesn't have all the answers. 
Faust is what you call a seeker. He's always looking for spiritual answers, you know, a path to follow. He doesn't find a truly satisfying one in his church, so he keeps looking. He finds lots of things that intrigue him. Hindu gods, Buddha, Odin, occult beliefs. The spiritual world fascinates him. Mark was a very spiritual person, or what I would call a very new agey person. He was always into something. I'd come over to his house and he's like, look at this new Buddha statue I bought. I think he was seeking eternal knowledge of the universe. I think he just wanted to know everything there was to know about everything. Mark Foster grabs life with both hands. His curiosity about the world is insatiable. He wanted to know about everything and wanted to experiment with everything. He'd get into fly fishing for a couple weeks and he'd buy just thousands of dollars worth of gear and all this fly fishing equipment and he'd fly fish for like two weeks and he'd be done with it and he'd throw it in storage. I think that Mark very much was a boy at heart and maybe even <laughs> more than at heart. Everything about him was like, this is just gonna be great. It's just gonna be wonderful. Being a seeker works for Foster. It gets him out of his small Wisconsin town and into the Air Force. It gets him a pharmacist license and a successful career in the big city. It opens a lot of doors for him. One of those doors takes him to New Orleans. His trip there introduces him to Santeria. It's the spiritual awakening he's been looking for. Santeria is the Cuban version of voodoo. It's not a weird cult of spellcasters and zombie makers like in the movies. It's actually an ancient religion with millions of followers, and its roots are in Africa. Now, to people who believe in Santeria, the line between the spirit world and our world is not hard and fast. It can be crossed. Let's not get this wrong. There are lots of reasons to talk to spirits. Santeria's gods and spirits care about you. They can help you get what you want out of life. My uncle believed in Santeria as a tool, a means to an end. The power that he believed he could get or influence over people, and he believed it with his whole mind and heart. In the world of Santeria, there are about a dozen gods and untold numbers of ancestral spirits. The first step is to discover your own personal Orisha, the god whose path you are meant to follow. For people that are initiated into Santeria, you use different necklaces to find out what your guiding force or Orisha is. My uncle, he had taken on the mindset of, of Eshu, the trickster. Eshu is a hell of a god to follow. Listen, he's no cosmic mischief maker. He's more dangerous. Did Mark Foster pick Eshu or vice versa? In Santeria, it's always a little of both, but it is a good match. For one thing, there's nothing Foster loves more than a trick. Practical jokes are a huge part of his personality. He was a very funny man. He was into shocking everybody. Eshu's no ordinary prank player. He's the god of fortune and misfortune. And speaking of fortune, get on Eshu's good side with a few rituals and thoughtful gifts, and he might just pay you back. Bingo. In the late 80s, a new business frontier is opening. 
Everybody's got a new computer, but it won't do much. The information superhighway is still a dirt road. Did I mention how spiritually connected pharmacist is also a computer pioneer? When we were growing up, we always had computers in the house, and he would network them before we even knew what networking was. So he was very into the computers. Mark starts a technology company. He calls it Quanta, to exploit the opportunities computers offer. Maybe it's Mark's insatiable curiosity that opens his eyes to a new opportunity. Maybe it's his boundless energy that helps him exploit it. Or maybe it's the gods and spirits he asks for help. One way or another, Mark Foster is about to become very, very rich. It looks like Ashu has showed him the right path. But what the gods give, the gods take away. Mark Foster's life will soon be over. His chief disciple, Greg, will be the one who kills him. Mark's nephew, Frank, will be there to help. He decided it was time to die. But he didn't want to do it himself. He wanted somebody else to do it for him. By 1989, Mark Foster, pharmacist, father, spiritual seeker, voodoo initiate, is on the cutting edge of modern technology. Mark had a, a lot of inspiration and a lot of good ideas. He understood the principles of business, and he was a good salesman. By the end of the 80s, the computer companies have figured out a way to put huge amounts of data on a CD. Foster figures out if he puts loads of free information he gets from the U.S. government on a disc, he can make a tidy profit. What he makes is a fortune. One of Quanta's first products is the CIA World Factbook. It's a U.S. government publication that's basically an atlas. It costs pennies to burn one and sells for $130. When I first started at Quanta, it seemed like the sky's the limit. We had a good product that people hadn't seen before, you know, searchable disks full of information. It seemed like it would keep growing and becoming more successful as time went on. His sudden success opens the door for Mark to show another face, ladies' man. By now, he's ditch wife's number one and two, he finds number three right in his graphics department. Mark was the ideal boss when you're young and you want to have fun, too. We would go to a movie some days, just let's close down the company today and go to a movie. It was so easy to make money that you didn't really have to be business oriented. You didn't really have to think about the future. In 1993, Vice President Al Gore comes to town to promote the new technologies that will put America back on top. Mark and Quanta are the perfect photo op. Does Gore know who he's really sitting next to? Not a chance. To the world, Foster is the face of high tech capitalism. It made you feel like we were really going places. It really seemed like a, a huge moment. Mark catches the technology wave and succeeds beyond his wildest dream. He likes to think of himself as the smartest guy in the room. He could grasp anything fast, then move on. He can now check off master of the business universe. But he lets his company coast and dives deeper into voodoo. Mark returns to Solomon, his high priest in New Orleans. It's time to be reborn. For a resurrection to happen, of course, the old Mark must die. It's all symbolic. It turns out Mark wants to be more than a priest. He wants to be a spiritual master. In voodoo, that's a position you have to inherit. You gotta kill the priest who initiated you. 
It's more symbolic mumbo jumbo. No shamans are actually harmed. My dad always liked to be number one and the biggest and the grandest of whatever he did. He played the role of the supreme being. And what's a leader without followers? Back in Minneapolis, Mark sets out to recruit some. So he heads to the Magus bookstore. I hang out for spiritualists and other fans of the occult. There he finds 24-year-old Greg Friesner, another seeker. Friesner's fresh out of blooming prairie, Minnesota, where he was raised by his mom, Jackie. He was never shy, very outgoing, curious about everything. And once he sinks his teeth into something, that's it. <laughs> He's... He goes for it. Greg's spiritual quest started in a small prairie town, just like Mox did. He was into the dark music, and I think that's when he started getting into the dark religious beliefs also. We tried to get him to change, but like I said, he was stubborn. And that's, we had a big fight, and that's when he left for Minneapolis. Greg was very impressionable, very hungry for knowledge. He wanted to find a path. He wanted to feel at home somewhere. Greg was reading a book, and then Mark, I think, asked him about the book, or they just started talking about, you know, the occult. I would say he fell under his spell, no pun intended. Greg becomes Foster's first disciple. Voodoo is a religion about nature and different types of gods, and learning which god you correlate with. Everyone supposedly holds an energy of a god in them. And you're supposed to discover what path you're on in order to fulfill your life's purpose. He felt that he had fulfilled his life purpose by finding out what god he was to serve or what god actually was to serve him. Yeah, peas in a pod, those two. So with Mark's help, Greg discovers that his personal god is Eshu, that same Arisha as Mark. Eshu, the trickster, the scamp, the one who misleads you to make you wise. At the beginning, it's all fun, of course, but hey, the more the merrier. Mark is on the lookout for other spiritual seekers. His charm and personal magnetism turns them into followers. <laughs> Mark's gathering more and more initiates, and it's no coincidence that most of them are attractive young women. My uncle had a unique way with words and was able to convince almost anybody of almost anything. He was a very manipulative man. However, most of the time, he really meant well. He would manipulate anybody to accomplish his goals. But in his own mind, his goals were just and proper. He was somebody that people trusted. He built a rapport with people almost instantaneously. You met the guy and you just loved him. Mark's nephew, Frank, his surrogate son is drawn in. At first, my attraction to Santeria was curiosity. And that curiosity was met with some very intense sexual experiences with a number of different women that brought me deeper in. There were so many women coming and going and anybody would do just about anything for you. I began to believe what my uncle was, was teaching. And of course, I looked at him like a father figure, so I had complete trust. If you were adopted into this cult, you were, you were family. Mark Foster 
the only man in America who's a voodoo high priest and a high-tech CEO is getting richer by the day. This was a really high margin business when he started, which is why he called it a cash cow business and took the cow's head logo as the symbol of Quanta. He just had a fetish with bovine art for a while. He really got into the cows for a long time. That's probably the longest thing he held on to was his love of cows. As the cash cow keeps filling his bank accounts, Mark treats his followers to a great time. The business was going like gangbusters, and he was treating his family and friends. He loved limos. Just about every weekend, he was in a limo, driving his friends around. My father was very generous, and the more wealthy he got, the more generous he was. Money didn't really change my dad at all. He was just allowed to buy more expensive things and give more money away to people. He always treated everywhere we went. Just one little problem. As time went on, Mark was, as best as I know, spending more money than what he was taking in. You know, he was more interested in having fun than in managing a company. And as long as the company was doing well, he could have fun and not have to be too concerned about it. But the more there was competition in the industry, the more difficult it became. So today, suddenly, we really needed to get something done on whatever front. Uh, our technical manual isn't good enough. Tomorrow, it's something else. It's always, you know, rush to do this, rush to do that. But uh, there was no clear vision, no clear plan. Look, I got to admit, I'm no businessman, but I do know that Mark's walking a tightrope carrying a balance sheet that ain't balanced. Too bad his personal guard is Asio, the trickster. He loves leading you down strange paths. Mark's personal voodoo sect is about to morph into something closer to a sex cult. Mark Foster is on his way to die. He has convinced his number one follower, Greg Friesner, to be the hitman. In the past, Foster's voodoo schemes have all been spiritual symbolism. This time, it's for real. Foster believes his spirit needs to change bodies. He's figured out how to make that happen. He's got it all planned. The seeds of the bizarre tragedy that will end Foster's life are sown by a simple turn of fortune. He doesn't realize how fast yesterday's sensation becomes tomorrow's, where are they now? With technology, you've got to stay on your toes. His company is in trouble, and he just can't turn it around. CD ROMs are getting better and better, but Quanta is just churning out the same old, same old. What is the problem? Not only are we defective, we... Mark just started yelling about how things were so disorganized and we needed to get priorities straight. Just kind of everything under the sun that he could think of off the top of his head. Mark had his company on the cutting edge. A head start. He's now squandering. There was kind of a window there where he could have reinvested in the company and tried to grow it. And I think he just continued to spend money. And then it got to the point where that window closed. He couldn't reinvest because he didn't have anything left to do that. Mark's not one to let business difficulties get in the way of his personal life. As the business sinks, wife number three walks out, but that's OK. It frees up Mark to explore another path, spiritual swinger. He discovers a form of Indian mysticism called Tantra. One branch of Tantra believes the mysteries of the universe can be explored through sex. <sighs> uh, Tantra is just a sexual religion that 
my dad was into for a while and taught classes at his house and stuff like that. Really, who could focus on business when beautiful young women keep ripping your clothes off? Tantric sex was another thing my uncle was involved in where typically a man and a woman seek enlightenment through sexual prowess. You could find happiness and true love through the use of these different spiritual means. But honestly, the main draw was the, uh, at first was just the sex. Women involved in this cult would do anything for you. They were used for their sexuality and pleasure. And that was a big draw to get people into the cult. Say, hey, come on, come in, join up with us. Here, have her, or have her, or have these three. And we'll talk to you when you're done. They had very low self-esteem, and they felt accepted. They, they felt loved. And then my uncle would manipulate that into whatever he wanted. The ceremonies get wilder and wilder. It's demeaning to the vessels, but lots of fun for a young hedonist like Frank. The drums started going, and as we danced, uh, blackness just came across my body. I knew I was there, but I, was, I wasn't um, completely lucid of what was happening. And when I came to, I, I was completely naked, and so were these two other women. We were in a different state of mind. I know I had had sex with both of these women, this was a, a very intense ceremony. Well, I was told by my father that everybody in the house was sleeping together. I would say he was happy with this arrangement. In case you're wondering what any of this has to do with voodoo, the answer is nothing at all. The mixture of tantric sex and African gods has forced his own invention. He's woven a mishmash of beliefs into something I might as well call Fosterism. It suits them just fine, and the handful of followers who keep hanging around. By now, Mark's company Quanta is a far cry from the beacon of innovation Al Gore admired. The office is empty except for Foster and a giant stack of bills. He would be trying to scramble around doing everything himself, fill what little orders he had for UPS that day, and answer whatever phone calls he could answer. And you could just see in his face kind of the, the weight of the world. He was taking things very, very hard. He wasn't fun-loving anymore. For so long, he could focus in on the fun and the generosity to people and ignore the reality of the life he was making, of the problems he was making. And now, everything was coming with a price tag. It was all of these, you know, bills coming in, all these dollar signs telling him how much he had screwed up. I think that he, he felt like he had failed, and he just didn't have it in him to pick himself up and start over again. When the business collapsed, his income collapsed with it. Losing the cash cow was difficult on him. Not long afterwards, a relative finds Foster in a closet holding a gun. He ends up hospitalized for depression. It's a low point for sure, but you can't keep a smart, charismatic high priest down for long. When Mark Foster is released from the hospital, he's broke. He rents a few rooms on the wrong side of the tracks. He takes yet another wife, Sarah. Believe it or not, she's the sister of wife number three. Well, Sarah comes with some baggage, a kid and a hostile ex who wants custody. Mark believes voodoo spirits can help fix Sarah's custody battle. He sends a posse of followers to a cemetery to cast some evil spells. 
myself and Greg had been asked to intervene in a magical sort of sense. The plan is to persuade the spirits to make something bad happen to take Sarah's ex out of the picture. So we brought what uh, could be termed vessels, people that could be used without consequences to ourselves, into a cemetery and did a ritual ceremony involving a sacrifice over um, a person's grave. Now, I'm told you have to be really careful when you call up dark spirits. They can turn on you. It's way safer to dupe somebody else into doing your dirty work. And we had these three initiates actually do it. Manipulation That's what it was. Selfish is another word. Selfish and evil. Make no mistake, to a believer, magic has power to help and harm. And Mark Foster has crossed a line here, using what he thinks is his influence in the spirit world to harm somebody. Up until now, you're not be far off and thinking of Foster as a fun-loving eccentric. But when you start trying to hurt people with your spiritual powers, well, there's a term for that. Black magic. Santeria's dark side. After almost a decade, the party's over for sex cult priest and businessman Mark Foster. He's broke. Craig Friesner, Frank, and a couple of diehard vessels remain. With his back against the wall, Foster's quest for spiritual power takes a dark turn. There was some talk of, of sacrifice. They talked about finding uh, a black girl and raping and murdering the girl and then burying the girl somewhere. Is Foster capable of murder? He wants his followers to believe he is. Remember how he symbolically killed that voodoo high priest to take on his powers? Foster tells them it wasn't symbolic at all. He really killed him. Although he had loved him, he had taken his life in order to assume a lineage of priesthood into his own body. If we were to divulge this to anybody, the same thing or worse would happen to us. There is no evidence any of that happened. I think it, it was part of his way of manipulating the younger men around him and to also create some fear. This is when the cult got really dark. Everybody was watching everybody, and it was a different atmosphere. It wasn't the fun party atmosphere that it had been. So Mark Foster has come to believe his black magic gives him power over life and death. Now, you and I consider death a certainty. Foster doesn't. But here's the rub. You know that old saying about life having two sure things? Mark Foster has no power over the other one. Oh, what was it again? Oh, yeah. Taxes. He never paid his taxes. He uh, just ignored it. And the IRS was coming after him. He owed somewhere in the area of two to three million dollars in taxes. That's two or three million more than he has. And never paying your taxes? That's jail time. Not even evil spirits can stave off the IRS. Or can it? Foster comes up with a getaway plan. He buys life insurance and names wife Sarah, nephew Frank, and follower Greg as his beneficiaries. So what's his bright idea? It's simple but bizarre. He will get Greg to shoot him. Then Ashu can move his spirit into Greg's body. Oh, the IRS will never find him there. And the plan gets even more ingenious. The insurance money will make life comfortable for Sarah, the kids, and the reborn Foster. All his problems solved with just 
one little magic bullet. It's flat out crazy. Does Foster believe it? No one knows. But he does convince Frank and Greg. Foster said that it was his time to go. He's reached his spiritual capacity on Earth, and his, his body is just useless here at this point, and that his soul now needs to enter into his highest disciple. Greg was supposed to take on Mark's identity, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. He was now supposed to be, in a sense, the man of Mark Foster's household. That was the intention for the money, was so that, you know, Greg could administer it accordingly for the children, for their futures, for the wife. It was a very convoluted story, but somehow my uncle was able to have it make sense. And we believed him. We all did. Like it was the morally correct thing to do. I don't know why he got caught up in it. It sounds, sounds ridiculous to me. To inherit the man's soul, it, it just, it, it's, too bizarre for me. July 17, 1997, the day before he is to die, Mark Foster sends wife Sarah away. Then he tapes a goodbye video for his kids to watch. The Africans believe that this life is a party. In order to go home, we have to get our party right, or at least we have to strive to get that party right. It was hard to watch because I could see the sadness in my dad's eyes. We celebrate life as we celebrate death. Death is nothing to be afraid of. Death is a great cross, crossroads, a change in attitude, a change in longitude, a change in the way that we perceive our spirit. When we reach that portal, they'll ring some golden bells. <laughs> He was depressed, and I saw a man who needed help and just couldn't, couldn't get it together enough to get help for himself to admit that he had a problem. And sometimes we may need to call on the help of what the Africans call the Rishans, the spirits. I asked him, is there anything else we can do? Do we have to do this? There's got to be another way. And he had said, well, there's two choices. We can go do this, and this will happen to me, or we'll take you, and we'll sacrifice you, and you can take my place. And then he said it was his destiny. He was master of the domain, and you didn't have a choice. Mark's plan requires him to treat his body to one last fling at earthly pleasure. There was a woman that came in, and she was considered a, a, a vessel to use before we did this. There was a number of different sexual acts performed with this woman, and then she left. My uncle was prepared um, for what was to happen next. When morning comes, Foster and his two loyal followers head out to meet their destinies. It's waiting for them on a dirt road, just across the Wisconsin border. The emotion was so intense. It's, it's hard to put into words the, the, the feelings that I had to help end my uncle's life. My uncle and Greg got out of the car. Well, Greg covered himself in kind of rubber clothes and had a gas mask on to avoid any blood splatter, as it were, which seemed to me to be just 
not fitting. If this is meant to be, why would you do that? My uncle grabbed his 44 caliber rifle, cocked it, put it in Greg's hand, and then pulled the barrel up against his chest. My uncle nodded, and Greg pulled the trigger. But it didn't fire. Mark Foster was a prankster. He was a trickster, and he tested Greg's courage, so to speak. And I think that maybe somewhere inside of him, he thought, oh, this is just another one of his uh, tests. So my uncle took the gun, made sure the bullet was chambered, handed it back. Mark's nephew, Frank, watches from the car. I don't know if he helped him squeeze the trigger or if Greg did it on his own, but there was a shot. My uncle fell over and uh, died. Mark was the trickster which raises a lot of questions, you know? Was this all a trick? Was it a trick on Greg? Instead of killing himself, you know, he needed some glorified way of doing it to sensationalize himself. And guess who has to pay for it? It's this young 24-year-old guy that really believed him. You know, I think it's sad. It's cowardly. Mark Foster's plan is that his soul will move into Greg freezing his body. As far as we can tell, it doesn't work. Greg Friesner does not become Mark Foster. He becomes a criminal, a murderer. And thanks to his name on that insurance policy, in the eyes of the law, he's the worst kind, a killer for profit. When Greg came back to the car, we were both pretty devastated. He had told me that my uncle had said, his last words were, no, it's not me. This isn't me. It's not happening. I'm crying, and then he realizes what he had done, and then he starts crying, and and it took a little while for us to stop. And from there, we went and disposed of any would-be evidence when we got back to my uncle's house, reported him as a missing person, which was per his instruction. A Methodist minister finds Mark's body and says a prayer for him. He was found and he was dead and he was shot. And um, we were just in shock. We, we just broke down. I was sad that the inevitable had happened. I thought Mark was really going to crash in some way. He was on this roller coaster ride and it had to come off the tracks at some point. Foster has one last trick, one final manipulation. During the autopsy, they found a note in his shoe that um, had the names of two men on there. One of the names is that of Sarah's ex, the one fighting for custody of his kid. It's an attempt to frame him as a murderer. It definitely turned into a wild goose uh, chase. Within days, they discovered there was something more, more bizarre uh, involved here. Foster, the trickster, planted all kinds of false clues to hoodwink the cops. Their confusion doesn't last long. Investigators discover Foster's farewell video and the insurance policy. Police suspect something odd's going on. And Angela, Mark Foster's daughter, is sure of it. She and her cult member cousin are close. Angela offers to wear a wire. The cops take her up on it. My cousin did say stuff that implicated himself. 
um, like they'll never find the gun and stuff like that and said that my dad's death was like a party and um, like it was a celebration. It takes Frank quite a while to realize what he's done. About a year and a half after my uncle's death, that's when it dawned on me that I was involved with the, the actual murder of my uncle. I could have done something to stop it, but I didn't. And that's something I deal with every day. Police are sure it was Greg who killed Foster, but they can't prove it. Not until Frank confesses. I wanted to clear my conscience, and I felt that the only way to have a fresh start in life was to tell the truth, and I did. It was just time for everything to come out. Greg Friesner pleads guilty to second-degree homicide. He gets 20 years. Frank admits to being his accessory. He spends three years in the slammer. Greg said, you know, I knew it was a matter of time, um, but this is part of my path, this is part of my journey, and I'm ready to face it. And that he stands by what he did. He believes it was right. He believes that it was part of the journey. To this day, he speaks very, very highly of him. He truly believes that Mark Foster was an amazing man. I have said to Greg, what the hell were you thinking? Why, why would you do something like that? And he did not answer me. I do know that he took another human being's life, and that's very wrong. But I love him. He's my son. I think there were a lot of different facets to Mark Foster, and I never can say that I knew who the real Mark was. I can say that I think he felt trapped in the end. Eventually, when I came to grips with reality, I felt that I had been taken advantage of by someone that I looked at like a father figure, but even bearing that in mind, I still have love for the man, and, and I hope he found peace. It speaks volumes about Mark Foster's power and charm that the two people his spirituality quest messed up most still love him. Foster really believed his black magic had power over death itself. He thought he had become as powerful as the spirits he worshiped. Crazy? Maybe. Egomaniac? Oh, that's for sure. And his ultimate manipulation was his most self-centered. His children are fatherless. His two closest followers went to jail. Mark Foster's god, Aishu, is known for leading his followers down the wrong path. But Aishu's not to blame. He's also the god of free will. Mark Foster made his own choices, and he dug his own grave. I forgave my cousin because I knew of my dad's involvement into his own death. And I knew that my cousin loved my dad and would do anything for my dad. When I look back on the time spent with my uncle, it was simply and purely a path of madness. And it got crazier and crazier and crazier until the madness finally ended, at least for some of us.